Good evening, everybody. Uh, you're all very welcome uh, this evening to our latest uh, Irish Wildlife Trust webinar. My name is Porrick Fogarty. I'm the campaign officer with the Irish Wildlife Trust. And if you're not familiar with the IWT, uh, we are a non-governmental charitable organization. We've been around since 1979. And our job is to raise awareness of biodiversity and the importance of nature to uh, people. And uh, as part of that, uh, one of the things we've been doing for the last few years is holding um, monthly webinars, which have proved to be very popular. And so um, most of them, the vast majority of them, uh, barring the odd technical glitch, uh, have been recorded and are on our YouTube channel. So please do, uh, if you're not familiar with uh, our work, please do go on to our, our YouTube channel and you will see um, the many different environmental topics we've discussed over the last year and a half or so uh, from climate change to biodiversity and, uh, and all the exciting things that are happening uh, these days. If you can support uh, our work, uh, that is always very grateful. Uh, we try to keep these events free uh, to make them accessible, but uh, we are also a membership-based organization. So please do uh, join. And uh, if you join, you'll get a copy of our magazine. This is our latest issue of Irish Wildlife, which you know is an actual you know, hard copy magazine. It goes out to our members uh, every season and it's full of uh, fantastic stories and competitions and all kinds of things. So please do uh, consider that. Now, before I move on to our speakers this evening, a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, we intend to uh, go on this evening for, you know, maybe about an hour or so. Uh, there's pretty good interest in this. I'm sure there'll be uh, questions and discussion at the end, so we might run over a little bit, but we won't run over too much. The uh, uh, webinar is being recorded. So uh, if you know anybody afterwards who discovers they were sorry to have missed it, uh, you can direct them to our YouTube channel, as I just mentioned, uh, where we will be posting this webinar in a few days. Um, I think that's pretty much it. Uh, you'll notice um, at the bottom, uh, if you have a question for either of our speakers, please do put uh, that question into the Q&A button and I will monitor that uh, at the end and put your questions uh, to Colin or Dara. OK, I think that's pretty much it uh, from me. So this evening we're talking about big predators uh, and that is always a topic of uh, interest. Um, an excitement, I think, uh, when it comes to Ireland, as obviously we don't have any. Um, but it is fascinating to see that um, uh, there has been research underway about uh, uh, predators in Ireland and there has been a resurgence of interest uh, in them and their role in our culture, in our society, uh, in our ecosystems. So that's why I think it's been fascinating to uh, to discover uh, the research from our two speakers this evening, which has been published uh, uh, quite recently. And they're gonna talk about their work uh, this evening. Now, um, uh, I will post links to their actual papers in the YouTube page, and I'll also put it on our Twitter channel as well, if you want to read more about uh, their work afterwards. So first up this evening, we have Colin uh, Gilfoyle, and Colin is, coming to us this evening from Newport, a stormy Newport in County Mayo, uh, where he's uh, working on his PhD uh, on the Neffin Forest and uh, Neffin National Park. So this is also, I think, something that is very interesting to us. So we'll have to get you back, Colin, uh, once you're finished your PhD to tell us about that work, as we'll be very interested in it. Um, uh, but he's going to talk to us today about his recent research about um, the suitability of Ireland for Eurasian links. So uh, over to you, Colin, uh, in your own time. Thank you. Perfect. Is that coming through okay, Pork? Uh, just a second now. Uh, yep, there we go. Very good. Thank you. Okay, brilliant. Thanks. Thanks very much, Pork, for the invite. And thanks to everyone who's come along tonight. So yeah, I'm going to talk to you. This is, this is a bit of work that got published recently, along with my co-authors, Ryan wilson Pair and Joanne O'Brien. Um, this is a bit of work I did for my master's um, thesis about two years ago. And yeah, basically asked the question of how suitable ecologically Ireland is um, in terms of hosting a population of Eurasian lynx. So I'll start with a bit of background, firstly, on lynx. 
they're the third largest predator in Europe, behind, of course, the um, wolf and the brown bear, Ireland's two other extinct carnivores. They've got a pretty wide range in distribution. Um, this map here shows their European distribution. It's quite patchy, as you can see, particularly in Central Europe, where um, the population has been recovering through a series of reintroductions. Lynx are woodland specialists. They'll operate in both broadleaved and coniferous woodlands across their range, and their home ranges can be quite large. So in places like Switzerland, it can be um, a few hundred kilometers squared and up towards Scandinavia where prey densities are lower. It can be as much as 1,000, 2,000 kilometers squared. So pretty large home ranges. And they prey mainly on um, small ungulates like this roe deer, um, other deer species as well, or, or um, uh, chamois in the Alps. But they're other, also prey on um, stuff like hare or small birds uh, as well as that. But their main prey would be small deer. Okay, um, just to give a bit of background then in terms of lynx and their potential past in Ireland, a lot of you probably know the story, but Ireland was of course covered by ice um, in the last, during the last ice age. That ice then started melting about 24,000 years ago, leaving Ireland uh, as an island somewhere between 14 and 16,000 years ago. Um, and after that point, of course, it would have been difficult for uh, mammals in particular to colonize the island. Then um, around 10,000 years ago, or just around, just before, trees started to colonize, and we've seen, firstly, this pioneer species like birch, and then up towards oak and others, other um, stuff like elm as well, and we reached 80% forest cover. Um, at that stage, it's thought that um, the deer species in Ireland all went extinct, and the main prey must have been um, wild boar, hares, again, small game birds, stuff like grouse. And, and that's around the time the only fossil evidence we have of lynx was dated to about 9,000 years ago. Now, so that's the, about three fossils that come from a cave in, in, I think it's County Waterford. Now those bones do need to be redated. There's been kind of updates in the methodology, I think used to date bones. So that date uh, is possibly going to be updated in, in the future, hopefully. And so we're kind of left with um, fairly sparse evidence about their presence. We can only really speculate as to how they may have got here, how long they were here for, what they fed on, those sort of things. And now we think about uh, this conversation of reintroducing them. Ireland, of course, now is very different how it would have been 10,000 years ago, um, shaped, you know, obviously shaped massively by human activity. Our forest cover went through a huge period of decline and is now increasing again, although it is largely conifer plantations. We have also seen massive increases in both native and non-native deer, so we feel there possibly is a prey base there. Um, th there is maybe some argument that we have to, we have some obligation to explore reintroductions of um, extinct native species through both the Habitats Directive and the UN Convention on Biological Diversity as well. But I, I think perhaps the biggest and the most important reason for doing this this study was was actually the growing public interest in lynx. Um, I've just got here kind of mostly a series of tweets I picked out mentioned in lynx and um, you know just to highlight the real interest that there has been over the past number of years um, in, in kind of bringing these species back and the effect they may have on the positive effect they may have on ecosystems in Ireland and all this interest interest sort of culminated in this RT news story back in December, which I have to say kind of took me by surprise because when I started this study, I think it was 2021, there was no one really talking about lynx and wasn't really mentioned in the media a lot. And so it's, it's quite positive, I think, that the discussion came so, so far so quickly in that space of time, only a year or two. Um, but but perhaps the only thing was we were maybe skipping a step. We were asking the question of, of should we reintroduce links um, before we maybe had answered the question of could we, could they survive here? Um, and especially when we know um, that habitat is very important, we need to make sure there's enough habitat that the population could survive here. If we were to bring them back, it can't be just done, um, you know, off the cuff. It, it mightn't be successful. There's a lot of evidence um, gone into carnivore translocations, particularly across Europe and other areas of the world. So we need to start looking at that, that question first. And that's where my study came in. So the UK luckily is much further along in the links discussion. They've done a series of different studies looking at habitat suitability, connectivity, long-term viability, all this stuff. So that made my life a bit easier because I could sort of take those methods that they've developed and, and um, adapt them to the Irish context. So 
Um, the study took four main steps. The first was to identify how much habitat there is for lynx in Ireland simply, and then look at, okay, how well connected that habitat is, how many lynx could exist in that available habitat, and then lastly, how long could a population survive or could a population survive long term? So to begin with that first step, how much habitat is there in Ireland for lynx? Um, so to do this, we, we um, used this habitat suitability model, um, and it was a rule-based model which basically followed these four steps. We take the woodland data sets that we have for the Republic and Northern Ireland. We apply these buffers, which basically take into account the um, areas around forest edges that links would also likely to be used. And wherever those buffers then overlapped, they merged into one bigger patch. After that was done then, we overlaid unsuitable habitats such as large water bodies, urban areas, stuff like that, and removed that um, from, from the habitat patches. And then the last step was to apply these area thresholds. So basically um, each patch had to be a certain size. I think the minimum size was 45 kilometers squared and had to have a certain level of woodland cover to be considered in the final model. So this was the result of that. We ended up with 33 habitat patches. 11 of these classed as small, so that's between 45 and 73 square kilometers. And that's basically a patch that would be capable of hosting um, one female lynx home range. The uh, green patches then are medium patches between 74 and 549 square kilometers. So they would host um, at least one female and male, but less than 20 um, lynx home ranges overall. And there was no habitats which would be greater than 550 square kilometers classed as large um, in Ireland currently. So as you can see, the patches are quite, they're quite patchy across the landscape. You know, they seem to be quite fragmented, but that was our next question then. Okay, well, how well connected are they? Could links actually move between these patches? Um, so again, um, for this analysis, we used um, what's called a least cost path approach. So Basically, for every habitat or land cover class, we uh, assigned a cost. So um, habitats like woodland and scrub would, would have low cost because they don't pose a great risk to links to move through. And then stuff like urban areas, large water bodies, roads would have a higher cost because obviously they pose greater threat to a dispersing links. And then the, the lowest accumulated cost between any two patches is your least cost path. And that'll um, give you some indication of whether a lynx could possibly move between two patches. And then using those patches or using those paths, we can, we can see which ones are viable and then which ones are not viable and create these sort of habitat networks. So that's what we did. And this was the result. So you can see the patches are now color coded according to their network. Going southwest, kind of up from Kerry Cork, all the way actually across to as far as Offaly, you have a, a habitat network occurring. That's the largest network. Then up towards Donegal and down towards Leach and Sligo is the second largest network. And then you also have two smaller networks occurring in the Wicklow Mountains and in North May as well. Yeah, so that's that's summarizing that. Um, okay, so the next thing then was to look at population sizes. So um, there was a study done in Scotland, again, um, by Hetherington and Gorman. They basically showed that there was this correlation between lynx densities and log transformed undulate biomass, which is, which is really handy because once you have an idea of the deer populations, you can then predict how many lynx could possibly um, survive in an area. However, when I was doing this study, we had no deer data to work with. Now that is changing. I think there is some new data be coming out soon, which I'll mention at the end. But at the time of writing, we had no such data to work with. So basically what I did was I took three um, lynx uh, densities from Europe that have been recorded in different studies. So a low density of 0.3 lynx per hundred kilometer squared from Scandinavia an intermediate density then from Switzerland and a high density um, lynx population in Poland, just to give a, a wide range of the sort of population we could expect. So for example, in the Southwest Ireland network, we expect somewhere between eight and 87 lynx to be um, to, uh, to use that habitat if, if all of the habitat um, was, was covered. And then for the, for the, if all of the habitat in the country was occupied, you'd expect somewhere between 11 and 141 lynx. So the last question then was population viability. Could, could a lynx population actually survive long-term given that available habitat and its connectivity? 
Um, and so to do this, we use this software called RainShifter. Again, it was used um, previously in a study in Scotland to look at suitable reintroduction sites there. We used it for a slightly different process, but, but basically what this um, software allows you to do is sort of model the dispersal process in a more realistic way. Um, so you, you give the software those habitat patches and um, the different costs associated with the land covers, like I mentioned previously, and then you can input these specific parameters um, for any species. So stuff like um, survival, different survival rates at different life stages, um, you know, how many offspring species have, stuff like that. And that will give you a good idea then of, um, you know, population viability when you model these things over a long period of time. So basically ran three different simulations each for each of those densities that I mentioned on the previous slide, the low, medium and high densities. And then we modeled for a maximum of 100 years. And for each simulation, we did 100 replicates. And at the start, so at year zero, it was basically assumed that all habitat was occupied. So we started the population of carrying capacity to see, OK, if you got to that stage, could, could a population then survive, hypothetically? Um, so, so the likelihood of, of extinction under the current scenario, as you can see, quite high. So basically, this graph is showing the number of replicates that were extinct at a given year. So you can see the blue line there. That's your low density population. And by year 20, I think it is, 100% um, of those replicates were extinct. For the intermediate density population, it was a bit higher. So I think by year 55, all of them were extinct. And then for the high density population, you actually had a 1% chance of survival. So not great overall. Um, what we did then was we, we took it a bit one step further and said, well, what, what would actually happen if you increase the woodland cover, if you increase the habitat available, because that's what maybe we would expect to happen going forward in Ireland, given that um, we obviously have very low wood, native woodland cover at the minute and we have all these climate targets to reach. Um, so essentially to do this, we, obviously we don't know where woodland is going to be planted in the future. So um, as a sort of crude way of increasing woodland cover, I essentially added um, a buffer of 50 metres to each existing woodland patch um, in order to increase the woodland cover. And that brought it up to about 18% for the island, which is somewhere what we're aiming for if we're to meet climate targets. So just to give an idea. Um, so to, just to see how that impacted things then, it actually didn't have too much effect on the low and intermediate populations, only slight increases those. Where it really had an effect was on the high density population. So that actually then had a 63% survival um, chance um, after 100 years under that increased forest scenario. Um, so that's quite positive. And just to summarize then, um, under current conditions, it's, it's probably unlikely. It would need to be maybe a heavily managed population um, in order to work. Um, under future conditions, then there is a chance, um, depending on where woodland goes, how connected it is, and also then the prey densities, which is the unknown, because obviously, as you can see from those graphs, the density of links will be determined by the, the prey that's available. So once we have a better idea of prey numbers, we can estimate links densities, and that'll give us a far better idea of how um, viable populations might be. So I'll finish on this slide and um, just with a few things thinking forward now, what's what's maybe the next um, steps in this conversation or, or what's to look forward to now going down the line. There is, as I mentioned, that whole thing of, you know, the, the redating of the bones and the, and the scarcity of evidence for links in Ireland. Um, so that'll be an interesting one just to give us a better idea if we do get a redate on those bones, you know, maybe give us a better idea of, of when they arrived or how long they might have been here. Um, I do think this is an interesting paper, just thinking about the whole native question, you know, um, we have quite an interesting scenario in Ireland where humans have, have influenced heavily what um, our sort of faunal assemblage. So it's it's quite interesting to think about what we class as native and what we class as non-native. And that might that might be um, um, further discussed um, as the links discussion goes, you know, in the future. I think that's a, quite an interesting discussion. Um, then in terms of the analysis itself, we, we have new data coming out all the time. We have this new land cover map now, which I think will give us a fair, more accurate representation of woodland and particularly stuff like scrub and, and tree lines that maybe weren't well represented by the forestry data sets. And then also hopefully we have, as I said, this um, you know better estimates of deer populations in, in the country as well. 
and that that can all be used then to make more accurate predictions and basically rerun this this whole analysis again and get a bet, get better better view of things um as well as that we i suppose coming from you know europe and other areas where links exist there's always new information coming out about what the species can tolerate this was an interesting study that came out only very recently um that looked at how lynx adapt their habitat usage across different areas in Europe and basically showed that lynx can tolerate quite a high degree of human modification as long as there is refuge habitats for those, for them to um, you know, retreat into when they need to, like woodlands or, or sort of rugged terrain and mountains as well. So that's quite interesting. That means, you know, down the line, we when we're running, when if you rerun this analysis, you might have um, different information about links that that we can change the parameters slightly based on what we know and where what they can tolerate. And you know the big question then is will we see this increase in forest cover in Ireland? Um, obviously we we have to meet our climate targets and we've in the past had all these different issues of you know where trees have been planted and how they've been managed and you know as well in, in agricultural policy I think farmers have been penalized a lot for um having trees on their land so uh, if we can solve a lot of these different issues i think it goes a long way to you know bringing having more of a societal acceptance for woodland back in the landscape and that'll go to increase in for forest cover as well and other countries you know i've just given two examples there costa rica and nepal have shown um that with the right supports you can you can increase woodland cover massively you know in a relatively short period of time so it can be done and, and just finally to mention that this is a study that looked at the ecological side of things. And when you're thinking of um, predators, I think Daryl probably touched on this as well a lot more. There is obviously the social side and that's a whole other study that need, would need to be done at some stage in the future if, if the links discussion ever got serious. Um, that's the stage where they are at now in Scotland. They recently did a social feasibility study. It basically asked the public, do we want um, Eurasian links back in our country? So. Um, they started the links discussion, I think, back in the early 2000s, and it remains to be seen now, you know, is it 10, 20 years down the line, is that going to be the same case in Ireland? So, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Maybe a nice thing to think about. Thanks very much again for everyone who came along and listened, and yeah, I'll be happy to answer any questions at the end. Uh, thanks very much for that, uh, Colin. Um, before I move on uh, to Dara, I might ask you, I mean, you, you mentioned at the beginning that most of our tree cover in Ireland is conifer plantations. I mean, do you think the habitat quality uh, is an issue as well that needs to be looked at? Uh, I'd certainly have my doubts as to whether the plantations are, you know, suitable habitat. Now, I'd imagine lynx would definitely use plantations for, you know, cover, but whether they'd be ideal um, hunting habitat, uh, I'm not so sure. We'd, we'd certainly learn more um, if links were reintroduced to Britain as they'd have similar plantations as to how they'd use those. Uh, because I don't think you have quite the same, I could be wrong in this, but I don't think you have quite the same um, sort of plantations in Europe. They will no doubt use con conifers woodland, but it's just, you know, that habitat heterogeneity, whether that exists and whether that's, um, good enough for for links. I'm not so sure. Mm -hmm. The the issue of them. I mean, I think they they prey on roe deer uh, mostly. I mean, is, would there be much of a difference between those and seeker deer that we have? Do you think? Um, yeah, that's a good question. That's another another unknown. Like there is so many unknowns when it comes to Ireland because it's such a unique landscape. You know, um, going back to the densities, like how you know how would links densities be affected by the lack of roe deer in Ireland? Would they simply just you know yeah, as you say, use roe deer, you know, they have there's certainly evidence that they predate on much larger red deer, although not that often. Um, or would they, you know, resort to going towards smaller prey? It just, it's, you know, remains to be seen, I guess. Very good. And just finally, because I'm interested in the the the, uh, the issue around the bones. And um, mm -hmm. I mean, is that in your this is probably, you know, veering into your opinion, but, you know, it's yeah, an important yeah. opinion. I mean, do the bones matter at the end of the day or how much do they matter for this debate? Um, well, if you're asking my opinion, I would I would I would I don't think it's a huge thing, um, you know, I think we have to be sort of sensible when we think about what species are in Ireland now. We know so many were already brought here by humans. 
um, we have to maybe think about in terms of you know vacant niches and stuff like that rather than was this animal here this many thousand years ago and that's the only reason we should bring it back you know you know who's to say even the bones we have now who's to say that wasn't they weren't brought there by humans you know we can only use i think the past i heard so i heard i think david hetherington saying a talk before use the past as a guide but maybe not as a rule book i think that's a good a good thing to go by very good very interesting i'm sure i'm sure we'll have more questions for you later on uh, but we're going to move on and our next uh, speaker this evening is dara sands and uh, Dara is coming to us from Ross Trevor in County Down, uh, but he lives and works in Norway mostly at the Uni Norwegian University of Life Sciences, and his background is in conservation biology. And uh, he is nearly finished his PhD, I think. And uh, Dara is going to talk to us about a fascinating uh paper he that was published uh last year i think dara on uh on wolves and coexistence uh in ireland so over to you dara in your own time yeah good thanks very much Patrick. uh can you hear me okay and see the slides yeah perfect yeah you might go full screen uh on your slides it might be better Yeah, so thanks, Mark, and uh, thanks very much, Colin. That was a very uh, informative and interesting talk, and I think I'm going to sort of pick up where you left off there um, with your point about focusing on the, the social aspects of, um, of wildlife reintroductions, of um, human-wildlife interactions. So my talk this evening is going to be partly based on my own PhD research. Um, my first article, as Podrig mentioned, um, was focusing on the, the historical dimensions of human-wildlife conflict and coexistence in Ireland. Um, looking at the wolf as a case study um, and building then on that paper I've been looking at um, the planning um, management planning and management of the, the red kite in, in County Down and um, so that's sort of uh, the two main species I've been looking at sort of the social dynamics and the social conflicts surrounding uh, uh, these two species um, so just briefly before I begin my talk, I'll introduce myself. So as Patrick said, I'm from, from County Down in Northern Ireland. I uh, grew up in Strever. Um, I had a brief spell in, in Cape Town in South Africa where I studied conservation biology. Um, and for the past five or six years, I've been based um, at the Norwegian University of Life Sciences, um, where my PhD research has been focused on uh, rewilding conflicts and coexistence. So just to begin the talk, um, I'll start with some background, basically. Um, again, this image might be familiar to, to some of the audience this evening. So um, rewilding has basically emerged um, in the context of growing concerns about biodiversity loss um, and amid sort of growing calls for the need for transformative change, essentially to, to halt biodiver biodiversity loss and to reverse biodiversity loss. Um, so, Rewilding um, then basically uh, has emerged as one possible strategy. Um, several scholars have suggested that rewilding should be central to restoration efforts um, that are needed to overcome the global biodiversity crisis. Um, and also uh, rewilding proponents are also suggesting that this will require a paradigm shift in the coexistence of humans and nature, and that rewilding is very much aligned with these um, global initiatives calling for transformative change in terms of how uh, not just conservation is practiced, but in terms of how our social and political systems um, are working or are not working for nature or people. Um, so beyond rewilding support within policy circles, rewilding has also uh, gained a lot of interest um, amongst the public and in Ireland and the UK and other parts of the world. Um, for example, David Attenborough has, has argued that we must rewild the world, that rewilding the world is easier than we think, and that a century from now our planet could be a wild place again. So these arguments for rewilding, they've um, gained a lot of momentum, they've gained a lot of traction in Ireland and in other places. Um, uh, but of course, these arguments for rewilding, for conservation, they're not necessarily new. So the focus of my PhD has been on the, the species reintroductions aspect of rewilding. Um, Again, reintroductions, they're quite a long established conservation technique. So for example, the first 
a large carnivore reintroduction took place in Poland in 1937. And since then, there have been ongoing conservation efforts basically to restore species um, across their native ranges in various parts of the world. Um, and in, addi in addition to um, these conservation projects focused on reintroductions, uh, there have also been, there's been the ongoing recovery of large carnivore po populations in Europe, which is attributed to um, conservation legislation that was introduced in the 1970s, such as the Berne Convention, such as the EU Habitats Directive, for example, are considered to have been very important in facilitating the recovery of wolves, of, of lynx, of bear, um, for example, as well. Um, there's also other factors that have maybe played a role as well, but um, basically, following uh, large scale historical declines of wolf populations in recent years have witnessed basically quite a, a significant recovery in wolf populations. So I think this um, European context is quite important in relation to the, this, the wolf debate um, in Ireland at the moment. So as of 2016, um, the wolf, the status of wolf populations in Europe was uh, there are 17,000 wolves um, and nine populations. Um, across the, the continent of Europe, 13,000 to 14,000 wolves were in the EU, so this was in 2016. Um, this research was conducted by the Large, Carn Large Carnivore Initiative for Europe. Um, since then, uh, there was a study published um, in 2022 last year, which is basically an updated assessment of the conservation status of the wolf in Europe. Um, and basically, based on the, the latest evidence um, and the latest available data from 2022, um, it shows that the total number of wolves in the 27 EU member states is likely now to be in the order of 16,000, um, and the number of wolves in geographic Europe is likely to exceed 21,500. So that's in the space of six years. Um, the number of wolves has increased uh, significantly, uh, and the wolf range has also increased significantly over this period of time. So in many ways, this is considered to be a... Um, a conservation success story. Um, I think many rewilding supporters have latched onto this idea of the wolf as a, as a powerful symbol of rewilding, as a poster child of rewilding, which links back to um, this powerful rewilding sort of story or myth about the return of Yellowstone, that return of wolves to Yellowstone Park, um, and the studies showing that this triggered um, uh, cascades. Um, but beyond the you know, they reported the ecological benefits of the return of wolves. There have also been um, some social problems um, that have resulted from the return of wolves. So apologies, this is quite a, a large um, piece of text here, but this is from the same report published in 2022. Um, so basically the authors of this study were arguing that the return of the wolf in so many countries, it doesn't come without an impact on human activity. So although the return of the wolf is seen by many as being extremely beneficial, um, yeah, there have there are costs, there are impacts associated with with living with wolves. So, one of the other points that they make then is that, on the one hand, given the absence of large areas of wilderness in Europe, wolves have almost entirely re-established their populations in highly modified landscapes where humans raise uh, raise livestock, hunt wild ungulates, and use forests and mountains for tourism and recreation. So again, this links to the point that Colin made about how that the recent study that showed that lynx are potentially able to adapt to human modified landscapes as long as there are refuges um, available for them or to retreat to with wolves. They're, they're more of a generalist species, so it's possible for wolves to, um, to adapt more easily to, to human-shaped landscapes. Um, and they're also able to, the, this latest evidence suggests that wolves are able to persist um, in landscapes where there's a relatively high density of people of 90 persons per kilometer squared. Um, so there's a, there's a few points here basically that are important in terms of um, some of the preconceived ideas that we have about wolves, that wolves uh, require wilderness areas, that they require potentially forest habitat, um, which links to to a much greater extent, whereas the situation is, uh, is quite different with wolves as, as we can see from the evidence in, in Europe. Um, and in Ireland, then, um, the idea of bringing back wolves has been, <laughs> uh, it's been controversial to say the least. Um, my PhD research started in 2017, and shortly after that, I think it was um, Eamon Ryan had proposed this idea of reintroducing wolves, um, which was obviously met with uh, a mixed response, to say the least. Um, so part of my research has been exploring 
why um, why the idea of bringing back wolves to Ireland is so is so controversial, is so contentious, um, and yeah, basically, so some of these conflicts they're perceived as being conflicts between people and wolves, but <clears throat> the impacts between the that the impacts that wolves have on people through livestock predation, for example. Um, but recent studies and recent research on human wildlife interactions is suggesting that these conflicts are essentially uh, fundamentally social and political problems that are driven by people with, uh, with different interests, with different values. Um, so that's something that I've been looking into in my research. Um, with rewilding, um, some of the, the potential causes of conflict are related to the uncertainty about the role of people in rewilding projects. So this has been a, a long-standing critique of rewilding. Um, that rewilding, as maybe many of your audience will be aware, um, you know, it has this roots in the U.S. wilderness movement. Um, it's based on you know the, the strict separation of people and nature. Um, there's an emphasis on you know natural processes, natural ecosystems, whereas there's less emphasis of, on the role of people in ecosystems and the way landscapes have been shaped by people, um, yeah, over generations. Um, and there's also a perception, which is a uh, yeah, maybe one of the, the main sources of conflict in, in Ireland. This is uh, the antagonism and tension between rewilding and, and farming. This issue, this question of whether or not rewilding is compatible with farming or it isn't. Um, and I think just before moving on here, it's important to emphasize that, you know, rewilding as a concept, as a practice, it's kind of evolved, it's come a long way from its its origins in, in this US wilderness movement. Um, it's interpreted in a different way by different people. So there are some rewilding projects that are um, place much greater emphasis on including people within them, but then there are some maybe that are going more down this slightly more exclusionary pathway. Um, but these debates about rewilding in Ireland, you know, they rewilding, although it's often framed as a novel approach to conservation, um, there's a longer history of conservation in Ireland and conflict over conservation in Ireland. So this image, um, which I took from Twitter, it appeared a few months ago um, um, with some children just holding up placards, showing, um, expressing their opposition to the idea of reintroducing wolves into, into Ireland. And there's one about stop the land grab, no more EU designations. So, I mean, it's in one, on one hand, it's easy to you know, dismiss um, protests and resistance like this, but at, at the other hand, it's important to consider um, sort of the, the deeper drivers of these conflicts and to understand the conservation context in Ireland, where this opposition to conservation is coming from. Um, so that's something I've been looking at a little bit as well. Um, so in Northern Ireland, for example, and this was a study conducted almost 30 years ago now. Um, that basically the conclusion was that the Department of Environment in Northern Ireland that was exercising an essentially top-down control uh, through the designation of protected areas. There was very little consultation. Um, there was this sort of uh, idea that conservation was being imposed. Um, and not only were, you know, were there basically social costs as a result of these measures, you know, the protected area designation, they weren't being very effective in terms of their uh, primary function, which is protecting biodiversity. And similar arguments have been made in the Republic of Ireland as well. Um, Hilary Toby, for example, has been quite critical um, of National Parks and Wildlife Service of conservation, sort of um, yeah, state governed conservation. So arguing that you know their operations have been largely uh, non-transparent. Um, and they, they're accountable basically to other scientific experts, but not to the general public. Um, and I mean, you know, this conclusion is probably quite you know controversial, but you know, she's arguing that environmental the environmental management regime in the Republic of Ireland is profoundly undemocratic as a result. Um, and this is something basically that uh, yeah, I've looked at in one of my in one of my papers as well about the red kite reintroduction in County Down in Northern Ireland. Um, so prior to the red kite reintroduction, there is a, an ongoing debate about the possibility of designating the Moore Mountains as a national park. Uh, this proposal that provoked quite a lot of opposition. Um, once the dust had somewhat settled, red kites were introduced a few years later, um, but there are still ongoing um, sort of uh, conflicts and tensions that weren't necessarily resolved 
effectively before the red kites were brought back. Um, and that has had an adverse, an adverse effect on the red kite population to some extent. Um, and of course, going further back then, and this has um, been the main focus of the, the paper uh, that I've had published last year, is looking at the sort of the deep historical roots of these conflicts. So, you know, questions of land ownership are extremely uh, sensitive in Ireland. Um, conservation, it is a form of land use as well. So, obviously, it's going to become part of that uh, controversy, depending on how con uh, conservation conservation measures are implemented. Um, and my paper basically it has looked at um, it's basically traced this history of coexistence between people and wolves in Ireland up until the 16th and 17th century, and then it's looked at how wolves have been become entangled essentially in what were you know social conflicts. I think many of us are familiar with the history of that um, during that period. So that's something that I've looked at in, in the paper that was published last year. So the focus then of the PhD is looking at how how will how can it be possible to transform you know what are essentially social and political conflicts over conservation over rewilding towards a form of uh, coexistence between people and wildlife and between people and people. Um, so uh, co um, human wildlife coexistence, it's been included as a, as a target in the post 2020 biodiversity framework, which was agreed in December last year. Um, it's under target four, which is to effectively manage human wildlife interactions to minimize human wildlife conflict for coexistence. And the IUCN have recently published uh, new guidelines in human wildlife conflict and coexistence. So coexistence, sort of like rewilding, it's um, it's emerging as sort of a, the latest conservation buzzword in a sense. Um, what does it mean? Well, like rewilding, it means different things to different people. Um, one definition of coexistence, basically, or some of the key features are that it involves the long-term persistence of humans and wildlife in shared spaces. So in that regard, it's a departure from uh, maybe more traditional conservation strategies that emphasize the separation of people in nature through protected areas, for example. Um, and a key aspect of coexistence as well is that it, it involves tolerable costs to, to both. So it recognizes that coexistence does not mean conflict is absent. Um, it means that coexistence, um, conflict is part of coexistence, but it's um, about finding ways then to, to manage that um, coexistence, to manage conflicts in a socially legitimate way. Um, and so these conflicts are extremely complex. Um, one possible entry point for looking at how to, to, facilitate, co to facilitate coexistence and to sort of move beyond co conflict um, is to try to build and maintain trust with landowners and land managers. Um, so that's con considered to be a, a potentially um, a, a very important um, approach for facilitating, co facilitating coexistence. Um, so in the spirit of trying to, to work towards this idea of coexistence in Ireland and sort of in relation to the wolf debate, um, there's a couple of, um, I think, claims that are made by by proponents of wolf reintroduction that sort of require some um, um, somewhat, uh, yeah, some scrutiny essentially. So for example, last year, um, Danny Healy Ray, he made the news um, for our, based on this comment that, um, yeah, sensationalizing this, uh, the possibility of wolves being reintroduced to Ireland. He said that there wouldn't be a child, chicken or lamb left in the country if wolves were reintroduced. Um, so this is sort of an ongoing yeah, source of uncertainty, essentially, in the wolf debate in Ireland. You know, are, how much the answer to wolves pose to people, to livestock? Um, so a study published um, last year, it was a long-term um, study looking at wolf attacks in humans between 2002 and 2020. Um, so it found that the number of wolf attacks, their wolves do attack people in certain situations. Um, most of these attacks were linked to rabies. Um, so but uh, Healy Ray, he was also responding to calls to, to bring back wolves um, on the basis that they could control Ireland's exploding deer numbers. So that's sort of one of the main arguments, uh, ecological arguments that's used to justify wolf reintroduction in Ireland. And um, again, it ties back to this Yellowstone um, story about the return of wolves and the potential, the, the ecological benefits they'll bring. 
Um, but again, looking at the evidence, um, you know, such claims about the, the, the ecological role of, of wolves um, it is possibly exaggerated. There's a lack of evidence to support it. And it's, it's also the context is very different in, in Ireland and in, in Europe, where, um, you know, the landscapes have been, you know, shaped by people. Um, so David Meck, he's one of the leading wolf biologists. Um, so he's argued that any such cascading effects of wolves that are found in national parks would have little relevance to most of the wolf range because of overriding uh, anthropogenic influences there in wolves, prey vegetation, and other parts of the food web. Um, and also when we're thinking about moving towards coexistence, so there's a study published uh, recently as well that's argued that one rewilding has played a very important role in terms of recognizing um, the importance of restoring lost ecological functions. However, one of the, the concerns about rewilding is that humans tend to be missing from the picture and there's a lack of appreciation um, for the histories of human interactions in, in certain systems um, and that as a result we risk omitting a key functional player in ecosystems past and present. Um, so looking beyond the, the ecological functions of roles, as, uh, ecological function of wolves as well, um, so another study has argued that again this is focusing on the the cultural aspect of, of rewilding and wolf reintroduction in Europe has argued that it, there's something about the lure of the howl of the wolf. It's as important to the rewilding effort as the claimed ecological role of the wolf. So basically, you know, when we're talking about the possibility of facilitating coexistence of reintroducing wolves to Ireland, you know, possibly it's necessary to, you know, to, to shift the debate essentially from this focus on, you know, the claimed ecological role of wolves and to start thinking about um, cultural values um, of wolves as well, and to sort of move this debate in a different direction. Um, so, and just to conclude, then on that point, um, so when we're looking in terms of looking to the future, then and looking to the possibility of coexistence in Ireland, and um, this is a quote by the environmental historian William Cronin. So he suggested that if we wish to preserve wild nature, then we must permit ourselves to imagine a way of living in nature that can use and protect at the same time. Otherwise, we'll keep reproducing the very contradiction, which has too often made modern humanity such a devastating presence on the planet. So I think this idea of imagining a way of living in nature that can both use and protect it at the same time could potentially offer um, an interesting pathway for coexistence. And I think in Ireland at the moment, um, there's quite a few initiatives that are trying to implement these alternative ways of, of living with nature. Um, you know, there's a Talat Bio, there's, um, for example, Nature Friendly Farming Networks, there's a project out in the burn, there's um, environmental justice networks. So I think uh, there's a lot of exciting possibilities for trying to think of alternative approaches to conservation that might be able to um, facilitate coexistence. So uh, I'll leave it at that. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, uh, Dara. That was uh, fascinating. Um, before I go to uh, the questions from our audience, um, I couldn't help but notice on your table there showing the different uh, wolf populations. Sorry, Dara, I might get you just to uh, sure. share your screen if you don't mind. Um, there we go. Um, yeah, so I was I was interested because you you are based in Norway, and uh, to many of us, Scandinavia seems uh, like a pretty big place with lots of forest, uh, and yet they don't have very many wolves. And um, Norway, in particular, I think has a very low number of wolves. And yes, this um, goal of coexistence seems to be quite elusive, isn't it? I mean, it's extremely controversial the whole issue about wolves in Sweden as well as Norway um is, is the, what's your take on that is there any sign of that uh, being addressed and if so how um it's it's difficult to see a way forward at the moment um it's basically it's in there's an ongoing debate um in Norway about wolf management about the the number of wolves that should be living in Norway um I think the current population is around 50 um something like that so it's you know it's quite a a low number based on you know the availability of habitat um, that and the number of wolves that could be supported there ecologically speaking. Um, I think yeah one of the main points I was trying to make there is you know because you know coexistence it's it's really fundamentally about these social and political issues. Um, 
that you know there it's there isn't really a, there aren't really silver bullet solutions essentially i think one of the in norway one of the issues is similar to ireland as well there's some um, tensions between this rural and urban dynamic so the wolf populations um they're primarily well nearly all in rural areas essentially and there's a uh, resistance to um to, to some of the legislation that's being introduced, for example, um, by people, li people living in those areas, because that legislation is being created in, in you know, urban areas in Oslo. So that's part of the dynamic. But at the same time, um, there are a few wolves in the forest quite close to Oslo as well. Um, you know, so it's, uh, you know, they they are finding ways to to persist in, in human modified in landscapes and, you know, close to where people are. Um, but it's, uh, yeah, it's. Or let uh, me put the let me put the question slightly differently because mm. there are many more wolves in southern European countries like Italy and Spain and uh, France uh, has growing numbers. And I mean, it's not like as you say it has eliminated conflict, but they do seem to be managing a bit a bit, bit better. Um, and have you looked at that? Are they doing something in those countries that they're not doing in Scandinavia? Yeah, I mean, there's some very research, very interesting research coming out of Spain on uh, wolves and coexistence at the moment. Um, Hannah Pedersen, who's based at the University of Leeds in the UK, um, so she's done some research on on basically looking at the, the social and ecological conditions that are necessary to support coexistence. Um, some of it comes down to institutions about the, the governance of wolves, about the amount of say essentially that local people have in in the management and decision making processes and that seems to be quite important like i said it's also about trust um and it's also about finding ways um basically essentially economic incentives or ways for people to live with wolves in a way where they can support their livelihoods as well um so that uh, hannah's research is definitely worth looking at in terms of uh, ways showing that it is possible for people to live with wolves and to minimize conflict yeah, um, I'm just looking at the questions now from our audience, and uh, I'll put this one to you, Colin, Colin and it's not uh, unrelated because Alan asks, you know, are, are links likely to target sheep as prey? And maybe I would broaden that out a little bit because the debate here so far has been, OK, wolves are just uh, too too much of a hot topic, but maybe, you know, links would not be so controversial and it there wouldn't be this uh, uh, pushback uh, from a coexistence point of view. Do you, would, you, would you agree with that? I mean, I mean, is there a likely economic impact from, from links, do you think? Um, so it's, it's quite interesting when you look across Europe um, where links and, you know, sheep, well, sheep, sheep are the, the, the main livestock that, um, that links would predate. They would, cattle and stuff would be much too large for them so in in eastern europe where people have always lived alongside predators links are, are no problem because they've had they have these um shepherding techniques that are, that are constantly in place it's it's mostly where you look at where predators have been eliminated at some stage and have been brought back that there is more conflict um scandinavia is is um is a pretty big one like in norway you have um, I think it's between seven and 10,000 sheep attributed to lynx each year, but that's uh, thought to be a hugely inflated number because of the way gr sheep are grazed in Norway compared to in other countries. Um, and a lot of these um, supposed lynx kills are never verified and they're, they're, they're um, applied for compensation by farmers. When you look at area like Switzerland, um, I think there was at, when the species were reintroduced in the, and then into the early 2000s, um, you might have had between sort of around 100 or maybe 200 sheep um, being killed every year but they sort of figured out ways to deal with the problem individuals and um, it was mostly sheep that were near woodland you know a sheep on an open pasture is, is probably not going to be in danger of being predated by lynx and um, I think I've seen a recent comment um, I forget what it was who it was saying on Twitter about uh, he was in contact with a Swiss lynx researcher and you know I don't think farmers are actually major stakeholders with lynx down Switzerland because they're just there and they're not a huge problem anymore so um, look I think there's no point saying lynx would never take sheep of course they would but it's it's probably a more manageable situation um, than than the wolves might be. 
There's another kind of related question from John. Uh, he asks about how links reintroductions are faring in other European countries, because there have been a few uh, links, translocations or reintroductions uh, in the last decades, haven't there? Yeah, so um, just off the top of my head, so there was a few in Switzerland and along the French border in the Jura Mountains. Um, they're, they're faring quite well, I think. Um, there's been more recent ones then, I think, uh, down in Croatia and areas like that where releases are actually ongoing. Um, I think though, there's been plenty of others then in Germany, um, Czech Republic, I think, as well. Um, as far as I know, most are doing OK. I think I think with reintroductions, it's, um, you know, when it's been a short period of time, it's very hard to tell how a population is doing. It really will take decades before you can see if it's been successful. Um, there's been, I think, the most uh, maybe popular un unsuccessful one was the was the reintroduction initially where they brought two males and obviously that was never going to succeed so um but i think for the most part that they've been successful the main problem is they're quite fragmented um and trying to link those populations up in the future is is um the main challenge now going forward um i've i've been following the the iberian links reintroduction and i mean that has been a huge success i mean along with the burn that's their kind of burn story in spain yeah uh, because the, the iberian links was really on the way out uh in the mm -hmm. 1980s and 1990s and, and they've done a marvelous job there um so i mean i guess it shows that it can it can be done um but um elizabeth is asking you know and, and i'll put this to dara first um what are the biggest changes that you think would need to happen? Um, she says, apart from increased forest cover and public education. But what, what do you think the biggest changes? What should we be working on if we, if we presuming that we want to see this, these things happen? Yeah, I mean, for one of my papers, I've been looking at the red kite reintroduction, as I mentioned, looking for lessons from that reintroduction that could be potentially applied to future reintroductions. Um, there have been some issues with. Uh, red kite persecution around County Down um, shortly after the first red kites were, were reintroduced, uh, released. Um, one of the birds was shot. I think a few, quite a few have been poisoned as well. Um, there has been a degree of reluctance um, amongst people living in the local area to basically, um, you know, to, to report these incidents, even if they have knowledge. Um, so there's a lack, again, going back to trust, there's essentially a lack of trust between people living in the area and the environment, the wildlife authorities, um, which seems to be quite a big problem. Um, you know, and I think that would also be a problem when it comes to reintroductions of, you know, potential reintroductions of wolves or lynx, um, that there's this you know, quite a fractious relationship between some landowners and between the state and between some conservation actors as well. I think that's something that would need to would need to be addressed. Um, obviously, there are mechanisms that could be used to to address those problems. You know, um, such as uh, compensation schemes, for example. But uh, these, you know, you know these sort of deeper underlying social tensions that are uh, they're they're a bit trickier to resolve. I think. Uh, Colin, have you any thoughts on that? What are what are the things? I mean, obviously your your study kind of showed that we have a lot of work to do. Uh, you know, uh, kind of on on, the, on our landscape, on the the physical characteristics of our landscape. But um, are there uh, what do you think we should be doing to try and improve the situation? Yeah, so I was trying to think of a good answer. I'm not sure I have one um, apart from just yeah the 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 obvious ecological barriers. Um, yeah, I suppose just, um, you know, talking about it, um, answering questions, um, you know, trying to make it not such uh, a huge undertaking, you know, of, I think predator introductions often seem like this massive, I mean, you know, they are a big deal, but, you know, it might maybe it's it's not that it should be think, thought of as a, a huge, a huge big thing that will require um, you know, everyone in rural Ireland is this big upheaval. So maybe just um, um, talking about it, answering those questions that people have. I think by talking to people on the ground, you learn a lot more 
about you know I was only talking to a friend of mine recently who farms and he just asked about it with interest and you know asking little questions about do they predate foxes do they do this and you know it's just little things like that um that's that's I, I probably don't have too good an answer to that one yeah well I mean what you're talking about is basically uh education talking about it having mm -hmm. people like yourself who can answer the questions mm -hmm. uh you know not not, be, not having the space filled with um maybe misinformation um, I, I would be curious, there was, uh, I'm not sure if it's still on the go, but there was a program, I think, in Sweden around links, which was basically paying uh, farmers for, it was a rewards-based program, rather than compensation, which is, I always feel compensation kind of assumes that you're going to suffer some kind of damage, and then you might get something after that. But a rewards program kind of flips that on its head, and it's giving more incentive to farmers, which is recognized in Ireland for hen harriers or freshwater pearl mussels. I mean, do you think that model could be applied to uh, to carnivores? Yeah, perhaps. Um, I, I'd love to read more about that one in, in Sweden. Um, I think, it's as you said, it's worked quite well with the likes of hen harriers. Maybe if it could be extended and trialed with some of our larger birds of prey. Um, and, you know, if you uh, we're, we're doing some sort of work on your land that involves creating these corridors for the likes of a lynx to move through. If you had evidence that they were on, you know, using your land, then if there was some sort of compensation. I think, yeah, sure that it that it might it might um, change um, perceptions. Yeah. Dara, do you think there's any uh, any chance that you know communities would want to have wolves, like not just tolerate them, but you know? want to have them yeah i mean i think one of the, the issues with the wolf debate in ireland is it tends to be somewhat abstract in terms of you know the the communities we talk about and the places we talk about bringing them back um you know it's quite a general debate and question about you know reintroducing wolves to ireland the specifics of where and the who aren't necessarily addressed so much and um i think it's it's very difficult to say you know it depends who the communities are, where the area is, um, you know, how the, you know, I think in, in conservation, um, the argument is that, you know, participation can play a key role in, in addressing conflicts, you know, ensuring that all stakeholders are involved, um, which, you know, is a possible way to, to possibly resolve some of these conflicts. But, um, you know, as a red kite reintroduction is shown in Northern Ireland, you know, it can be very difficult to determine who the relevant stakeholders are when you have a wide ranging species like a red kite, like a sea eagle. You know, uh, I think in the case of the red kites, the conservationists involved that they did carry out, um, <clears throat> you know, some consultation with local landowners, but then you had the case where the red kites were basically, you know, they're capable of flying around the whole country, you know, so it opens up this question of who is a relevant stakeholder. It also opens up the question as well of, um, considering transboundary management issues, um, you know, there needs to be, you know, the reintroductions need to be managed on an all island scale, um, because the range of links of wolves, of raptors, you know, it's, um, <clears throat> you know, they don't recognize the, the political boundaries that we've created in Ireland. So um, that's something that needs to be taken into consideration as well, just quickly on the, the question about the barriers to coexistence. Um, there are problems of wildlife crime in Ireland that, you know, Again, it's something that I've looked at with the red kite reintroduction. Um, you know, these uh, persecution inc incidents. You know, there there are laws in place that are you know supposed to prevent that from happening, but the implementation of those laws is often quite weak. Um, so maybe that's an area that's definitely an area with it that needs to be strengthened. I think um, because I think that's maybe a concern that a lot of people have. You know, our, the wildlife we have at the moment, you know, is is struggling considerably. So bringing you know a species like a wolf back, a lynx back. Um, you know, without addressing these issues, you know, it's maybe not going to lead to, um, <clears throat> you know, a very happy ending. Yeah, absolutely. And it actually relates to one of the questions being asked here by Stephen, who noticed from your map uh, of the wolves that there were many more in Estonia than in Latvia and Lithuania, which are neighboring countries. And I, and I think it is important that you know, uh, uh, policies uh, and, and the way that laws are enforced or not enforced in different countries can be can be very um, uh, uh, critical, really, in how how these populations uh, develop. Um, 
I'm just wondering, uh, there's an also an interesting question here from Patricia. She asks, would uh, would a wolf take a lynx? And I think I actually saw a video on uh, uh, the internet recently about an, an interaction between wolves and lynx that they don't, uh, they may not get on so well with each other. Is that right? Um, anything about that? I, well, I, I'm, I think I might have seen the one that you'd seen. Um, I guess the assumption would be that um, wolves would be the more dominant and, and, and I think they would when they're in a pack or, um, you know, there's a group of them, but um, there was some uh, observations from camera traps of, of lynx um, and wolves interacting and, and it seemed that the wolves were sort of avoidant of lynx or lynx were following wolves, you know, and, and perhaps it's the other way around. Yeah, I'm not so sure though. Yeah, okay. Um, uh, oh, where's the question gone? It was oh, David is asking about in the Netherlands, and the Netherlands um, has recently had uh, wolves colonizing in Belgium as well, I think. Uh, have you, have you uh, maybe this is for Dara, have you been watching what's happening there? Uh, what, what are the conflict levels like in the Netherlands? Uh, no, I have been following the situation very closely in the Netherlands or Belgium, where I think um, wolves have begun to, to recolonize in the north of France as well, or in Normandy. Um, I know there have been some significant conflicts, quite serious conflicts um, in the south of France um, <clears throat> and parts of Italy as well, but um, I'm not sure what the situation is in the Netherlands. Again, the Netherlands is quite a, um, yeah. It's a very developed country. Um, the landscapes are heavily modified there. So the idea, you know, <clears throat> that wolves are doing relatively well or that they're able to reestablish there again, it challenges this idea that wolves are, you know, creatures of the wilderness that they require, you know, large uninhabited areas to, to persist in. Very good. Well, look, there's there's many more questions. I mean, I think the people are very interested uh, in it, but I might wrap it up just with one last question uh, to you both. And uh, given that you've looked at this question uh, closely, A, do you think uh, it is something that we should be pursuing? Uh, and B, if you were in charge of uh, such a program, what would you put in place? What are the what are, what are the kind of things that you think we should be doing uh, over the next ten years? So I'll ask you that first, Colin. Um, well, well, I'll answer in terms of links because I, I wouldn't have too much expertise in wolves, but I, I think we should, if we're thinking about it seriously, we should maybe not be pursuing it as a silver bullet to all our, our problems. We obviously have a huge range of environmental issues that that need solving and, and links aren't going to solve those. But we should think of it maybe as a long term um, step in, in a bigger, wider ecosystem recovery. And in terms of getting there, I think it will just come down to more coherent planning in our landscapes, you know, um, in terms of uh, afforestation, um, you know, creating these uh, wildlife corridors, you know, when we're planning new roads or whatever it may be, just um, more unified thinking, I think, would be the main thing to actually make it happen in the long term. And is it something you'd like to see? Yeah, of course. I'd love to see it as someone who, who uh, you know, she loves animals, it would be great to see, you know, but I think done only, only if it was done in the right way. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Wild nothing, maybe. Anyway, <laughs> yeah, that yeah. thought. Uh, Dara, what about you? Is it are you positively disposed towards it or, or what, what would you like to see happen over the next 10 years? Yeah, I mean, I think it's uh, a really intriguing idea. Um, you know, I've been looking at it through the lens of environmental justice as well. And there's an argument that, you know, rewilding represents a strategy for essentially uh, distributing the costs of conservation a bit more equitably across the globe. So um, I think, you know, living in Ireland or living in Norway, um, we're very happy that, uh, you know, that there's tigers and elephants and lions in the wild. And, you know, we want those species to exist and, you know, but there are costs that come with living with those species. And, you know, in countries like Ireland and Norway, we're not really very tolerant of those costs or willing to accept those costs. So I mean, I think there is a there's a justice argument to be made there for, for bringing wolves into Ireland. I mean, there's, I think yeah, there's, you know, these uh, cultural arguments and ethical arguments are perhaps slightly stronger uh, than the ecological argument for bringing back wolves or a conservation argument. I mean, I think the global conservation status of, of the grey wolf is the least concern at the moment. Uh, the population trends are increasing in most countries in Europe. So, 
the conservation argument for reintroducing Wolves to Ireland, I don't necessarily think it's that strong. I think arguments that, you know, the wolf will be an <clears throat> ecological saviour, that it's going to bring balance to the Irish ecosystems. I'm not entirely sure if that's a very strong argument. Um, also, the argument that, um, you know, wolves can help to restore the rewilding argument that wolves can help to restore self-sustaining ecosystems and we can sort of bring them back and then let them roam free. Um, I think that's slightly quite problematic. I think they're always going to require management. Somebody is going to have to make decisions about how they're managed. I mean, you know, Ireland is a, you know, it's heavily influenced by, by people. So somebody is going to be making that decision. So it's important to consider then, you know, who's making that decision, who benefits from it. Um, and yeah, I think they're important uh, issues to consider. Uh, and something you'd like to see happen or not? Yeah, I'm. I'm again. I think it's. Uh, it would be interesting to move, you know, this question from the abstract to the concrete. To you know, where is it going to be? Um, and in principle, I think it's. Uh, I'm. Yeah, I'm open to the idea. I think it's a. Uh, it's a important conversation to have. Definitely. Very good. Very good. Um, well, look, I, I leave it at that, and uh, and I want to thank you both very much for your your time uh, this evening in, in presenting your your research to us. It's uh, fascinating to see that these questions are being asked, and um, and I wish you both well in your in your PhDs. Uh, and I want to thank everybody at home for, for tuning in. Just a reminder uh, that the webinar has been recorded. I'll put it online uh, before the end of the week if you want to uh, share it with anyone else uh, who is interested. So just uh, thank you again to Dara and Colin and uh, thank you all again at home. We'll be back uh, next month. We have another very interesting topic uh, in our webinar series next month. And actually, before I forget, we have another webinar next week. Uh, with our friends in Fair Seas. This is around um, the um, identification of a hope spot, marine protected area off the coast of Kerry. Uh, so uh, do stay tuned. You'll hear more about that on our social media channels, channels uh, uh, this week and next. Thank you again and good night, everybody. <laughs>